Good morning. Uh, I'm Rocky Cobb, the ch program chair of the April meeting. Welcome. The APS gratefully acknowledges the generous support of the Kavli Foundation in underwriting this keynote session. In all its programs, the Kavli Foundation's hallmark is support for excellence in science. The APS is honored to have a partner of the Kavli Foundation to support this uh, keynote plenary session, The Frontiers of Physics from the Lab to the Cosmos. This morning, we will hear about exciting results from a laboratory 25 miles away, a laboratory 6,000 miles away, and a laboratory 1 million miles away. The first presentation will be by John Harris, cre uh, creating the primordial quark gluon plasma at the LHC. John. Thanks, Rocky. So it's a pleasure, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a pleasure to be here this morning and I thank uh, Rocky and the Kavli Foundation, the APS, for the invitation. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, results, first of all I'll give a motivation to talk about results from the Large Hadron Collider using uh, collisions of relativistic heavy nuclei. So my title is Creating the Primordial Quark Gluon Plasma at the LHC. So the LHC has been running uh, and operating with heavy ions since 2010. The heavy ions uh, run at the LHC for a month, a year. So let me go ahead and get started a little bit with the motivation. So this actually is a slide from uh, National Geographic in 1994. Uh, and you'll see one of the consultants is Michael Turner. Um, so you can imagine that space and time are emanating outward from the Planck time here. And you see that the forces separate and there's large inflation depicted by these arrows here quite rapidly. And then there's this period where there are Q's and L's and W's. This is the quark gluon plasma, uh, which consisted, where all the matter in the universe consisted of quarks and gluons uh, at temperatures above about 2 times 10 to the 12th Kelvin. And there's this transition region where you see all of a sudden the quarks are confined in hadrons after that that took place around 10 microseconds after the Big Bang. So the, one of the primary motivations of the field was, in fact, the prediction that there would be this deconfined phase transition if we could actually access it, possibly with heavy nuclei in relativistic collisions. So this is QCD quantum chrom chromodynamics calculated on the lattice. Uh, and this is one of the initial calculations some 10 years ago or so, and there have been many since. What I show here is the energy density over the temperature to the fourth, which is proportional to the number of degrees of freedom in the system as a function of the temperature of the system. Um, and what was put into this particular calculation is uh, a varying number of flavors of quarks and gluons themselves, and what one sees is a rapid rise at a temperature of around 150 to 175 MeV, uh, below which the quarks and gluons were confined, as I've depicted here, and above which you see that we have many more degrees of freedom as depicted in this calculation. And in this particular calculation, there's a transition at 175 MeV. I should say, in the last 10 years or more, uh, there have been improvements in the uh, lattice calculations themselves, the techniques, and also, of course, computing has improved tremendously. And this temperature uh, has gone down by about 10% or so. OK, the other motivation I want to give, if you look at the quark-antiquark -quark coupling constant, alpha q here, as a function of separation, if you take a quark and an antiquark pair and pull them apart, what you see, first of all, at a distance just short of a Fermi the size of a hadron, that, of course, we have, de uh, we have confinement, where the quarks and gluons are confined in the hadrons. And at these very close distances, in fact, this coupling constant gets very weak, and we have asymptotic freedom. <clears throat> 
Now, if you look at these different colored data points from the lattice calculation, you see that as you increase the temperature up to about Tc, which is about one here, this orange, one sees that this confinement potential decreases, so the coupling constant gets weaker, and at even higher temperatures, in fact, you expect deconfinement, or you don't expect the quarks to be confined in hadrons. Now, on the other end, uh, where the coupling constant is weak, Gross, Pollitzer, and Wilczek got the Nobel Prize in 2004 for this asymptotic freedom. And in his Nobel Prize speech, David Gross is quoted to say, before QCD, we couldn't go back further than 200,000 years after the Big Bang. Today, since QCD simplifies at high energy, we can extrapolate to very early times when nucleons melted to form the quark gluon plasma. So what are the big picture questions? Why are we looking for this? First of all, we want to understand matter at these very high temperatures, possibly high density. Shown here is one of many different phase diagrams, uh, all of them uh, more or less cartoons right now, of QCD matter itself. And so what one sees in this is temperature as a function of the baryon density. You see nuclei are here. Hadron gas here, as you increase the temperature, you uh, cross over to a quark gluon plasma. Here, where quarks and gluons are deconfined, the early universe came down right near this axis. And at the relativistic heavy ion collider at Brookhaven, at the large hadron collider with heavy nuclei, at CERN, where we expect, and it appears that we're populating this region. And of course, there are many other regions that are speculated about in the high density regime. So what are the states of matter that exist in this phase diagram? Can we explore, in fact, the phase structure of this fundamental gauge theory, QCD? And can it tell us about other gauge theories, like gravity, perhaps, or other transitions, like the electroweak, perhaps? Can it tell us more about the universe uh, as we see it now? So is this phase diagram featureless? What are the constituents at these high temperatures? I'll tell you about this quote unquote perfect fluid or perfect liquid that was discovered at Rick. And when does it become resolvable into quarks and gluons? Is there a critical point, like here, also like in water? Uh, that's the purpose of the Rick beam energy scan that's ongoing over the next few years. And in particular, what are the properties of this quark gluon plasma? Uh, in its transport properties, its coupling, its strong or weak coupling, and I'll tell you about the shear viscosity that we see, which is very low. And of course, are there new phenomena, new states of matter? So the standard model predicts that we should have a deconfinement phase transition at 150 to 175 MeV. In cosmology, this quark hadron phase transition must have occurred in the early universe. It may still exist, meaning the, the uh, quark matter in particular in the cores of dense stars. This is still quite speculative, though. Can we make it in the lab and establish its properties? That's the reason for the field of relativistic heavy ion physics. So it's a quark gluon soup, not one that you can get at Safeway, of course, but uh, here we go. So the Large Hadron Collider uh, is in Geneva, Switzerland at the CERN lab. All three large experiments, CMS and ATLAS, which are really designed for the Higgs search and supersymmetry, um, and the ALICE detector, which is the dedicated heavy ion experiment built specifically for this, uh, take data, uh, with heavy ions for a month each year. Here's a, a depiction of the three experiments. And of course, after the present shutdown, the LHC will come up with twice higher energy. Right now, we've run at 2.76 TeV per nucleon pair. That's the square root of S sub NN. So that's 2.76 TeV for every pair of nucleons that are colliding in a lead-lead collision. We've also just 
completed a proton on lead run. And I'll tell you about all those. So I would be remiss if I didn't mention the relativistic heavy ion collider. I just mentioned the Large Hadron Collider. I'll talk about results from both. Uh, the relativistic heavy ion collider is operating at from 5 to 200 GeV per nucleon pair center mass energy. These two machines cover three decades of energy in the center mass and are investigating this hot QCD matter that I've just talked about in the range of temperatures as it appears to be 150 to about 1,000 MeV in temperature. So first of all, we have a consistent picture of the geometry, the dynamics, and the evolution of these collisions. And I'll show that briefly. If you look at the multiplicities per participant in collisions of nuclei, as a function of the center mass energy, we see at energies less than the Large Hadron Collider, it looked rather linear on this semi inverted semi-log graph. But at the Large Hadron Collider, there is this rapid increase, so it's not linear. And these are just uh, kind of shaded results from proton-proton collisions. And this has given us information on uh, the geometry of these collisions. And in particular, what was quite interesting was, as a function of the number of participants, that's the number of, let's say, nucleons that are colliding in a nucleus-nucleus collision, where this is what we call a peripheral collision. There's not much overlap. And at this end of the spectrum of the number of participants, this is a head-on collision. The thing to note here, and what was quite striking, was that at the Large Hadron Collider, the red points, we see not very much difference between the red and the blue points. The blue points are the RIC data scaled by 2.14, which is just the increase in the overall multiplicity, but the dependence as a function of the impact parameter or centrality of the collision is quite similar. It appears that there are small differences here as you go to peripheral collisions, and this may do, be due to the initial conditions. We expect that there is more gluon shadowing at the higher energy because you're at a lower momentum fraction of the incoming nucleon, the, the partons have of the nucleons. And so we're eagerly anticipating further analysis of the proton on lead run that just finished a month ago to really look at this more closely. The other thing I want to point out is that the system size, as depicted by the three uh, coordinates that one gets from two-particle interferometry in collisions starting at even lower energies than RIC of heavy ions up to RIC itself, and then at the higher energy at the Large Hadron Collider. So this is as a function of the multiplicity density of particles. One sees at the Large Hadron Collider that, in fact, you have about twice the volume as at RIC, and if you transform this into volume by about a four-thirds factor, basically, you get uh, one to 2,000 cubic Fermi for the volume of the system when it decouples. And as a function of time, from those measurements, here we have the lifetime of the system as a function of the multiplicity. One gets about a 40% increase of the lifetime of the system at the Large Hadron Collider, or a lifetime of about 10 to 11 Fermis over C. This is now consistent with what we see in the hydrodynamical expansion from the calculations. So the second thing, the particle ratios reflect equilibrium abundances uh, consistent with the universal hadronization temperature, and this has been confirmed by predictions on the lattice. One sees here the ratios of the various different types of particles at the heavy ion collider at Brookhaven, and also the particles that have been uh, measured at the Large Hadron Collider, uh, along with the, the RIC results as well. And so in each column, you see a particle ratio. The ratio is denoted uh, by the vertical axis. And then the lines are fits using an equilibrium hadronization model at, with two parameters. And what one sees is that these temperatures are very much near that critical uh, 
temperature for hadronization. And it appears that uh, these are consistent with the equilibrium hadronization and universal, the universal temperature at uh, the parton hadron uh, hadronization temperature. <clears throat> I should also say, as I mentioned earlier, when I showed the lattice calculation itself, that, that those calculations now um, in equilibrium statistical hadronization models have come down to about these temperatures. And also, there are new calculations quite recently for non-equilibrium statistical hadronization, uh, which can describe these data as well. And that's something quite new and something we're looking forward to, further discussions and comparisons. So um, these temperatures, as represented by the ratios, meaning that the, part of the quarks and gluons hadronize at this temperature as it cools down are quite representative of what's predicted by lattice QCD. The other thing that's quite interesting, as initially observed at RIC and quite surprisingly at RIC, was that there's a strong flow observed and it's associated with a very low shear viscosity. What's seen here is a collision, non-central, where this nucleus is going that way and this one down. And what one sees in perspective view that you set up in configuration space something that's quite elliptical, and it's elongated perpendicular to this reaction plane shown here. However, the particles, if you analyze the azimuthal distribution, come out in the plane set up in this particular way. And so, in fact, you can Fourier decompose this uh, azimuthal asymmetry of the particles and see that the second component in the azimuthal angle phi, which is just the angle around the z-axis, uh, is asymmetric and that it has a magnitude that's represented by this V2, this amplitude. And this V2 is what we call the elliptical component or elliptical flow. What's seen, if you integrate this V2 over all momenta, that it increases from RIC to LHC energies. The LHC is at the top over here. And in fact, that it's quite well predicted by hydrodynamics with a very low shear viscosity. This led, in fact, to this discussion of the nearly perfect liquid. Here we have RIC. This V2 component is a function of transverse momentum of the particles. And here we have the Large Hadron Collider. What's shown are calculations from Schenke et al. using viscous hydrodynamics for different 8 over S, that's shear viscosity over entropy density, where this is ideal hydro. This is 1 over 4 pi. This is 1 over 2 pi. One sees that 1 over 4 pi does a reasonable job at fitting the data in the comparison. And I want to point out that Kofton, Sahn, and Sternyets in 2005 predicted that there is a universal lower bound of this quantity, A over S, that's 1 over 4 pi. And that corresponds to a perfect liquid. And they get this from strongly uh, coupled limit of non-abelian gauge theories using a gravity dual. And so if you plot this 4 pi eta over s as a function of temperature, you see that even for ultra-cold atoms, it's quite, quite low. Uh, helium water is a function of temperature here. And that this limit is down here. What we see at Rick and the Large Hadron Collider is this region. And of course, there's a large error bar, but it's just above or near or at this limit that's predicted by Cobden, Sahn, and Starnyets. Maybe a factor of two higher, but the uncertainties are still large. So let me say one other thing. Event by event, we can look at these. And there are fluctuations in the initial overlap region that, in fact, in the end, are highly impacted by this viscosity over entropy. This is for ideal hydrodynamics. This is for twice that lower, lower bound. And you can see that this initial 
event by event overlap distribution gets smeared out as you increase the viscosity over entropy. That's what you would expect. And in the end, your final observation may be smeared out as a result of that, so we can tell from the measurements, in fact, and that's what we're doing, and try to better determine what the 8 over S is. You can do an azimuthal decomposition into the higher harmonics, see which, which ones propagate through, and that tells you about the medium itself. What one can do, and this is just the same sort of thing, initial ideal hydro, and this is the, the lower bound, 1 over 4 pi. Uh, this helps to give us information on the sound attenuation length and also the Reynolds number. And of course, now you can say, well, there's a potential for looking at higher order harmonics, but we need much higher statistics to do this, to get to the, the uh, larger uh, val values of L in this Fourier decomposition, and of course the analogy is obvious there with the results, but we still have a long ways to go. So let me also mention that there's direct radiation that we see in photons. Here's the photon spectrum at the Large Hadron Collider. This is binary scale, next to leading order, perturbative QCD in blue. What we see is an excess, this is transverse momentum, this is a yield, we see an excess above perturbative QCD, and if you just fit this to an exponential, this excess, you get a temperature of just over 300 MeV for these photons, and at RIC, the same thing was done actually previous to the Large Hadron Collider, and their temperature was 220 MeV for the excess. The fits from hydro require initial conditions of greater than 300 MeV at the RIC energy and greater than 400 MeV at the LHC to be able to get these temperatures of photons that are emitted, which uh, in fact, I should note, integrates over the entire evolution of the collision itself. So in the last 10 minutes or so, I want to tell you about the, what we call the hard probes. We see that it's opaque to these most energetic probes. I'll define that. And let me just give you the conclusions real quick, and then I'll give you the details. So light and heavy quarks are suppressed at large transverse momentum uh, as they propagate through the colored medium, this quark lone plasma. Away side jets are quenched, and there's a jet energy imbalance. Um, and also, from the proton on lead initial studies, this confirms that, in fact, this is a final state effect and not from uh, the initial state, this suppression. So here's just something to, to look at the geometry of these collisions. Of course, they're highly Lorentz contracted, more than you even see here. As they collide, we have hard, what we call hard probes from, from the initial parton scattering, as in blue here. Note that the wave fronts pass through each other, leaving a highly excited vacuum, or the quark gluon plasma, let's say. The partons are propagating in blue here. They're radiating. They're interacting. Note that the quark gluon plasma is a colored medium. Note that the partons are colored. It's very much like a charged particle losing energy, traversing a medium in QED. But this is QCD. In the end, those partons, meaning quarks and gluons, hadronize. They make high momentum particles, like what we call leading particles or jets, clusters of hadrons. And in fact, from the binary nature of the initial scattering, we expect and can correlate on one side versus the other, the leading particles in the jets. And this should give us information on the interaction of these partons with the colored medium itself. So as at RIC, what we see and what we define is what's called the nuclear modification factor. <clears throat> this is just the number of any type of particle seen in a nucleus-nucleus collision divided by that number observed or measured in a proton-proton or nucleon-nucleon collision, scaled by the number of those nucleon-nucleon collisions in the nucleus-nucleus geometry. <clears throat> 
Now remember that changes depending upon the impact parameter of the nucleus-nucleus collision and the overlap of those two nuclei. This RAA, as we call it, in fact should be one if the nucleus-nucleus collision is a superposition of independent nucleon-nucleon collisions. And we see that for photons, Ws, and Zs. This is just RAA as a function of transverse momentum. Uh, from the CMS experiment, you see we're going out, or they go out to 100 GeV with their data in transverse momentum. And of course, you expect that for photons, Ws, and Zs because they don't interact strongly with the medium. Whereas if you look at hadrons, mostly pions, kaons, et cetera, they're suppressed by a factor of two to five. And so they're interacting strongly with the medium and these partons, in fact, show this energy loss and suppression of the high momentum hadrons that we observe. If you now look at the same value, RAA in proton on lead at the Large Hadron Collider, that's in blue, and in, uh, let's call it mid-central collisions or mid-peripheral collisions in green here of lead on lead, and in very central or large overlap lead on lead collisions, you see that in proton on lead, in fact, there's an absence or very little modification of this RAA or RP lead in this case for protons lead value, and that as you increase the centrality, note these figures here, that you get more and more suppression. This indicates that this, in fact, suppression increases with centrality and that it's a final state effect of the partons as they interact with the QCD matter. This is a comparison all the way out to 100 GeV of results at the Large Hadron Collider shown here. You'll have to follow my uh, pointer where, as compared to reading up there. Various model calculations and at the Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider where the suppression is not quite as much as at the Large Hadron Collider. Um, I should also say that these various models appear to be able to predict what we see at the Large Hadron Collider at these very high momenta, but only if they reduce the coupling strength. So maybe there's a running coupling with the momentum of the particle there. So in terms of jets, the first jets, jet results came out already early in 2010. This is from Atlas. CMS has a quite similar result. In fact, the same result. I show Atlas here. What we see is the energy asymmetry plotted here in this left graph. This is just the difference in the energy of this trigger jet minus that of the away side jet divided by the sum. And you see that there is an energy asymmetry. The trigger jet has more energy than the away side jet. However, on the right plot, you see that they're still primarily back to back. Now, if we look at data from CMS, I showed you this plot already. Here are the hadrons. They're highly suppressed, single particles. These are the jet results from CMS. If you fragment these jets, you get particles of about this momentum. So you see that we have this suppression that runs out all the way up to several hundred GeV for the jet momenta or 100 Me, uh, GeV for the particle momentum. So the jets are quenched at the highest momenta, something we still need to understand in terms of parton energy loss. Where does the jet energy go? If you have a trigger jet, and on a wayside jet over here, CMS has shown that in fact, um, maybe because of time I won't go into the details of this, but what you see is the red, meaning the high momentum particles are still found in the jet cone, whereas the lower momentum particles get spread out. And so therefore, this energy momentum imbalance is actually carried away or this energy loss of the parton by the low momentum particles at larger angles to the jet. Whereas the jet core itself appears to fragment like a jet in vacuum, meaning in a PP or an E plus C minus jet produced event. Last thing I want to mention, suppression of quarkonia, that's J psi and upsilon states. 
beautiful results from CMS on mu plus, mu minus, and you see J psi, psi prime, upsilon, Zs, what one expects. If you, in fact, have production of these heavy quarks like a CC bar pair in the colored medium, that they get color screened. When they get color screened, in fact, this potential drops, and it depends upon how strongly bound that pair is, and you expect to get uh, a sequence or a melting order for these quirconium states. CMS, in fact, sees that there's, this is the RAA for quirconia, that the upsilon excited states are more suppressed than the J psi, are more suppressed than the upsilon ground state. They've put this in terms of binding energy. They see this sequence as predicted by the binding energy of the uh, quirconium states. So, in fact, the more tightly bound quirconium states are suppressed less, that's up here, and the higher suppression occurs for the less tightly bound ones. So let me summarize. We have a consistent picture of the geometry, as I showed in one slide. We have many more uh, dependencies uh, that I didn't show. The particle ratios are consistent with equilibrium abundances at temperatures near the universal hadronization temperature. It has characteristics of a quark gluon plasma. It flows with ultra-low shear viscosity. There's radiation in terms of photons that have a temperature much higher than this critical temperature predicted for the transition. It's opaque to these very energetic probes. I just showed you that. And it has properties of color screening. And so there's still much to be done. And I'll leave you with that. Thank you. Thank you, John. If there are questions, please uh, go to the microphones that are in the aisles. While uh, people are lining up, uh, I'll ask a question. Sure. So you learned a lot at RIC. You're learning more at LHC. You've talked about energy scans. In this type of physics, how high of an energy accelerator would you like? I mean, does the information you get for the quark gluon plasma and things like that roll over for well, higher energy? That's a very good question. And, and so this strong coupling actually comes from the fact, if you look at the lattice calculations, well, at least my interpretation is that they don't actually reach the Stefan-Boltzmann limit, where you'd expect there to be weak coupling, okay? And so you have to go up in energy if you believe the lattice calculations, even higher energies, but to do that, I mean, you're approaching it asymptotically, and that's extremely high. I think it'll be quite interesting at the LHC to see by doubling the energy what happens. And if there's not a big change, then I wouldn't worry about going up any higher, frankly. Yes. But sorry, let me oh. just say the beam energy scan I mentioned was the RIC energy scan down lower to look for the critical point. Jan. John, this is a very beautiful overview. Thank you. But I have missed one very important uh, point, which is the question, what have you learned about the quantitative property of coagulum plasma? What is its energy density? What, it, uh, what are the properties we are touching with our hands? Right. Um, well, I showed you the, um, the lattice calculations. We can look at the number of particles produced or the transverse energy produced to get the energy density. If you use Bjorkane scaling, you see that it increases by, uh, you know, several factors, two to four, between RIC and the LHC. That energy density is much higher than any lattice calculation predicts it should be the energy density required. What we've learned about properties, transport phenomena, for example, this uh, entropy density, the shear viscosity over the entropy density is quite low, so it flows very easily. Without much resistance, we have to narrow in on that more. We have to learn more about all the other transport properties like the sound attenuation length, and in fact, maybe even try to narrow in on the equation of state. What do you want to know, Jan? What we see in the lab when the coagulum plasma falls apart, what, is, what do you see? Is this an object which has energy density of 10 GeV per Fermi cubed, or 
one or zero? What is its, no, no, I what mean, are its properties at the moment that you observe? Right. So what Jan is asking and what he works in is what happens at the transition. Okay, and he works in a lot of other things too. But um, you know, whether it's equilibrium, statistical hadronization, whether it's non-equilibrium, how does it fall apart? What's the time sequence between you know having quarks and gluons and then sitting in the lab and looking at hadrons? And you should read his papers if you want to know more about non-equilibrium. I, I really I think didn't he has something to, to, to read the let, papers. I, I think we have to move to the next question. Thank you. Uh, there's been a lot of emphasis on hot quark gluon plasmas. What about cold quark gluon plasmas, the composition of the interior of neutron stars and quark stars? Yeah, that's a real hard one in the lab, right? It's really more observational at rotations and things, the binaries. Uh, you know, when we collide these nuclei in particular, we always head off on, in that phase transition direction in the upward higher temperature direction and over to the left because we're breaking apart nuclei. What you want to do is put them together into something cold. Experimentally, that's more observational, looking out into the cosmos. Theoretically, you can see there are a lot of speculations. Okay, uh, let's thank John. Thank you, John.